It is 9.15, so we will uh, resume. Okay, so this is Chapter 8, and uh, it's the phases of a crisis. And, you know, as, um, as we were saying during the break, it's easy to get information overload and can have so much information that you kind of maybe even unexpectedly, uh, someone has a crisis and then you're there and you feel almost paralyzed. Like I learned so much stuff about what to do in the situation that now I have no clue what I should do because it's just too much information. Right. So uh, maybe this will help. And actually the book, uh, it's not that we're gonna learn everything in this book, but it's a good reference tool also in your library and as I call it, in your toolbox. So when, uh, Maybe when you're teaching it, or maybe you are helping someone and, uh, and you want to focus on their particular need, that you can go to one of these chapters and, um, and be refreshed. Okay, so we have the phases of a crisis uh, is where we begin. What happens in a crisis is people really don't know what normal is for their situation because it ha hasn't happened to them before. And like I said, they don't know if they're losing their mind, if they're going crazy, if what they're experiencing is normal. So it can really be uh, almost a frightening thing to people. So we can, uh, we can help them and prepare them for what they are likely to experience in their crisis. You've been in a crisis before for the first time, a serious crisis, and, and really not having a clue as what in the world is happening and uh, you know, the two major questions people have is, uh, why does this hurt so bad, and how long will it last? Those are usually the two questions that are asked in a serious crisis. Why do I feel? I didn't know I could feel this bad. Wow, what a great discovery. And it is kind of shocking, actually. And if we can help people to understand what they're likely to experience in this the great thing that happens is it can has a tendency of reducing their level of anxiety because they're somewhat prepared for what's likely to happen. Um, as uh, Dr. Wright brings out, that each successive stage in these four phases is usually uh, usually uh, the first one is shorter, the next one is longer. So successively, the phases um, are longer than the previous. And also the phases might overlap, and not only overlap, it could be when it's kind of a back and forth situation with the different um, phases. So phase number one, let's see if I can use my, my iPad, is uh, the impact. This is the impact phase. This is the briefest phase. How long is the impact phase when something happens to someone? Uh, it could be from hours to days. Uh, the more, the greater the loss, then the more, uh, then the deeper uh, the impact. Uh, one of the first things that happens is uh, uh, there's a sense of numbness, there's a sense of being stunned because of what happened. And um, there's also a decision that's made that I'm gonna face this situation or I'm gonna run away from it. And if we choose to run away from the, from the crisis or try to, then of course, what happens? Is it helping or hurting? hurting. It's only hurting, it's just prolonging the problem. It's postponing it. And so it is better to uh, to face the crisis head on, embrace it, go with the flow, as they say, and um, enjoy the, the white water emotional rapids as we go down the raging river in hopes that the waterfalls downstream aren't, aren't, too, uh, <laughs> aren't too high. Yeah, maybe that's a good analogy. Okay, so the impact phase, the first thing he mentions is uh, thinking capability. So in this phase, 
uh, our thinking is impacted and it is reduced. We can't really think as we should because we have this tremendous sense of disorientation. We're disoriented because of the trial. And uh, when, uh, well, let's, let's talk about it like we're helping someone in this imp impact uh, stage. We can't expect that when we're trying to help someone in the impact stage, we're giving them maybe correct information, but can we really expect them to, re to embrace it, to retain it, and to even kind of track with us? We could tell them something and it's like we never said anything because they are disoriented. They're confused, they are stunned, they are numb, they can't believe it's, it has happened to them. This is, uh, wow, very serious. And so uh, also we need to be there kind of coaching them because they are very vulnerable and are prone to make unwise decisions during this time. So they really need someone close by to just talk things through with them. And so therefore they need our help, and sometimes uh, it is uh, beneficial to put the instructions that we're giving them for their unique situation, uh, practical things, put it in writing. Say, okay, I'll be back in the morning, I'm leaving. The things we talked about, I'm, I've written them out, they're on the kitchen table, okay? So review those, and they say, okay, you know, that's helpful, thank you, I can deal with that. So we wanna provide them with the security and safety. And we wanna help them, but we want to encourage the person in crisis to do what they can do for themselves. So we wanna help them, yes, but they should do what they can do. That is helpful. Okay, then the next point here in this impact phase, we have the thinking is kind of incapacitated in their thinking. Um, and then the second is the lost object. And it is normal for a person to still be emotionally attached to the thing that was lost. And so there's, of course, a desire, and it's healthy and it's fine. There's nothing wrong with this. But there's a desire to uh, hold on. If it's a, a loved one who was lost, then it's a desire to hold on to their possessions. All of a sudden, we're looking at their possessions like, it's kind of like, you know, in place of the person, it's the only thing that's left of the person is the clothes they used to wear, or the photographs, the pictures, the photo album, you know, looking at pictures, and they are so precious. And so that is a normal phase because there's a, there, there has to be this detachment uh, to the, the, the lost, the person that was lost, the thing that was lost, and it takes time. And God is very gracious, and he gives us time, and he gives people time to detach and it can't be rushed the person has to be ready uh, if it comes to you know giving away possessions um, if you lost a loved one and you know there's your closet and there are their things and maybe weeks have gone by and you think yeah maybe I should give the clothes away maybe I'll take them to goodwill maybe I'll have friends come over and they can take what they want then all of a sudden you say, you know what, I'm not ready to do that. Then don't do it, right? But there comes a time when, you, when you're ready and you can do it. And so just be patient. And we should also encourage people to express their feelings. Talk about their loss. It's healthy. Talk about it. Tell me about so-and-so. Tell me about your husband. Tell me about your brother, your sister, your spouse. Tell me, what were they like? What do you miss the most about them? When you think of them, what comes to mind? Tell me about things about them that made you laugh. Tell me about some of the, about the best experiences you've had with that person. It's very helpful, it's very healing to do that. And then also there can be in this impact stage, which is the shortest stage, is a sense of, of uh, guilt that comes along with it. Uh, it is normal for children if they lost a parent or even a sibling. Children have the tendency to feel somehow that they're at fault. My mom died because it's something I did. I know it's my fault. I know when she told me to go up in my room and I caused all that fuss, you know, it's my fault. Yeah. 
That's the way they think. So they need to be told and taught that it's not, it's not your fault. Your mommy was sick. She had whatever. She had cancer. And it has nothing to do with you. It's not your fault. You, so that's important. They need to know that. And then, of course, there's survivor's guilt, uh, terrible train wreck, and 30 people died in the car I was in, and somehow I survived. I got out of it with a broken arm. That's not right. That's not fair. Why do I, all those families grieving and all those people that were killed, and, and I walk around alive and well? That's not, you know, people, person feels that's not right. I feel guilt about that. Well, what do they have to do with it? But it's what happens. And um, uh, some guilt that someone feels, mm, there might be no basis to it, and sometimes there's guilt, and there is a basis to the guilt. Can you imagine? Uh, maybe a spouse is lost, and there's a terrible fight that, or argument that happened the night before, the, the week before. Or maybe they were separated at the time, and... Uh, and all of a sudden there's this, oh my goodness, I said horrible things. I cannot take them back. I said horrible things, and now the person's gone. You know, wow, that's real. So what do you do? Beat yourself up? Uh, we have a Savior. We have confession of our sins. We have forgiveness. We have the blood of Christ. And he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That's what we do with those. We take them to the cross and receive forgiveness. You think the lost one who is passed on and in heaven <laughs> is holding a grudge or remembers it? I don't think so. Furthest thing from their mind. So we must receive forgiveness. So how are we doing out there? Oh, we have the, how the thinking is... Um, Capabilities are reduced. The lost object is tried to hold on to it. We have, uh, and the emotion of guilt that can come at this stage can come very powerfully. Okay, number two is withdrawal. Withdrawal. And also we could say confusion. In this stage, withdrawal and confusion is supposed to be an end. If I try and erase it, I'll mess up the whole thing. Okay, so first of all, we have, uh, I'll go through these kind of quickly because there are actually seven points to the second phase. And the first is emotional turmoil. Uh, it's interesting that people can feel like they are dead themselves, but yet their emotions are not. You feel dead, but your emotions are very much alive. And it's a whole conglomeration of emotions happening, sometimes simultaneously. It's very unique. Uh, there are times when we feel emotionally drained, and it would be preferable to suppress the emotions because we just are tired and don't want to deal with it anymore. Um, the grieving process might be hindered course because of this and this can be a problem because when we suppress the emotions then the healing has stopped and uh, it's at a standstill and then it can come out in other ways it can affect us uh, you know psychosomatically we we have physical issues because we're not dealing with the grief properly and then there's the full spectrum of emotions that we experience, sometimes we feel assaulted by different emotions, seedless confusion, danger, an impasse, desperation, apathy, helplessness, urgency, discomfort, all of those are listed there. And uh, so you can imagine, you can imagine it could be, uh, it could cause a panic attack. People don't die from panic attacks, but Panic attacks are very unpleasant when all of a sudden um, uh, you're, you're in a situation where there's adrenaline running through your body for no uh, apparent reason and your heart is racing and maybe you have the cold sweats and you, 
uh, lose your breath and you don't know what's happening. And uh, so that can be a, also a byproduct of, of, uh, of a crisis situation. You feel like you're totally out of control. Uh, next was uh, extra, extra support is needed, and that's what we're there to offer. And, uh, you know, how long should extra support be offered for? In some cases, these people say two years. And not starting off in an intense level, but then after that, uh, checking up on people with an occasional phone call or a visit. What happens is there is tremendous uh, love and uh, people's presence and phone calls uh, for the first week. And that's wonderful, and people help to shoulder grief. But then all of a sudden, uh, the week is over, the funeral's over, the graveside service, everyone's gone back home, relatives have flown back to California, people resume their normal lifestyle, and there's the grieving family by themselves. And all of a sudden, their world caves in. It was hard enough with all the support, now everyone's gone. And all of a sudden, you go, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, what do I do now? And so that's why continual support is needed for those in crisis. The third and for the second phase is uh, uh, people need help organizing. People need help to keep their schedules, to set their priorities, to try to resume their routines, maybe even cleaning their house, doing the dishes, all these things because uh, people can suffer from uh, uh, volitional paralysis. There's just no desire to do anything. And so how helpful it is if someone comes over and knocks on the door and come over for coffee and all of a sudden, hey, why don't you let me help you with this and let's do that. And What do you need? What do you need at the store? Let's take a ride. It can really be so helpful to people and someone to listen to them. The fourth is um, uh, what he calls, well, he mentioned self-pity. Looking to replace what was lost, uh, let's say it's been a divorce, and all of a sudden, some months later, the person is, uh, you know, I need a new spouse. It's like, whoa, 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 not so fast. That's probably not a good idea, or the loss of a spouse. You know, maybe, you know, maybe you should wait a year or two and let's just take it slow because you haven't even totally disconnected yet from the loss and you're trying to replace it with someone else. It's not going to work. You're just going to complicate the situation. You could get into a worse situation. First, you're grieving the loss of a loved one. Now you're grieving that you have this, that you're connected with this other person that you realize you don't want to be connected with. <laughs> So, you know, don't jump from the fire, from the frying pan into the fire, as they say. So self-pity. Number five of the second phase, uh, withdrawal confusion, is uh, people need counseling guidelines. So they need intervention. Uh, and again, we're asking them to talk about their loss, helping them in the grieving process, to talk about it, get it out, and heal. And, um, and make sure that they're in the right frame of mind when it comes to important decisions that they're making. That's very important. Number six is uh, verbal effects. That's for us. And when we're helping someone and they're in this with confusion, withdrawal stage, we must be careful with our words. Our words are very weighty. If we say the wrong thing, uh, if, we, if we're insensitive, then uh, you know it's going to really give that person a setback because they are so vulnerable. Not only our words, but the tone in which we communicate. And uh, as he says, it's better if we don't know what to say. It's better not to say anything. Just our presence can be helpful. Uh, and be careful that we don't lose our credibility by making promises that we have uh, no control over. No assurance that what we say is going to happen, like 
all this is going to be behind you and you're going to be fine. Or this is the worst thing that could happen. From this point on, it's only going to get better. Oh, well, who's to say? We don't know. Sometimes there are consequences. Okay, guess what? Your house burnt down, but it's all going to be okay. Well, we just, uh, your insurance company has just notified us that uh, for whatever reason, uh, they're not going to cover your loss because uh, the electrical system was not wired right and therefore was not to code. And uh, so it's, uh, it, they're not going to cover it. You're kidding me. I lost my house, my most precious possessions, and now nothing? Mm hmm Wow. God forbid, right? But those kind of things happen. So we have to be careful what we say to people. And, you know, we can... That's just an important point. To make sure what we say, we know it's true, and not make promises that we don't know if it will be that way. Okay, um, the power of right words. I had wanted to read something here, but I'm not going to do it because we'll be out of time again. And then uh, number seven, the last one in the second phase was assessment. Um, that is, we ask, how are you doing? Are you making progress? Let's talk. And are there conflicts that are unresolved with you that we can talk about? He gives the five basic focal points in helping a person in crisis. And the acronym is B-A-C-I, B-A-S-I-C, -I -I I'm sorry, is BASIC. And that is B, they're in your book, B is behavior patterns. Uh, those, that's a good assessment. Uh, are you back to work? How's it going? How's your diet? Are you eating? Are you sleeping? How are your sleeping patterns? Uh, well, I don't, I don't really sleep hardly any, anymore. Or I'm sleeping 16 hours a day, and even then I'm dragging myself out of bed. Okay, that's not good. That's not healthy. Uh, the effective functioning, effective speaks of affection, uh, emotions. Effectively, how are they functioning? They just feel kind of emotionally dead, or, you know, let's talk about how you feel. S is symptoms. How are you doing physically? Um, how's your health? Are there any physical symptoms of this, you know, the crisis? I is interpersonal functioning. How are your relationships? Are you communicating? With friends, are you in touch with your relatives? These are just basic things that you would check on when someone is in this phase. And then cognition, which means thoughts. Uh, are there any destructive, is there a destructive thought pattern? Are there harmful tendencies? Is, is the person considering suicide? That should not be ruled out. So those are the, the basic things to look for in the assessment. So what were those seven things in the, in the second phase, the withdrawal, confusion phase, the emotional turmoil, the person needs extra support, help them organize their life, uh, be aware of their self-pity in looking to replace what was lost, something that would be unhealthy, give them guidelines, be careful of how we communicate, and then how do we assess their condition? Uh, the third is the adjustment phase. Now it's looking a little better. The adjustment phase. Now there is a detaching from what was lost, and the depression is, is lifting, and there are now kind of these glimpses of hope that are happening. And it's all of a sudden, you know, wow, one day it's like the sky has cleared and now the sun is shining. And man, does it feel good. It's amazing. I didn't know I could feel this way again. My life is returning to me. It is truly amazing. Uh, when we had our uh, loss, uh, it's interesting, one morning Nancy came in and 
She said, I had the strangest uh, experience. And I said, what? And she said, um, she said, the flowers are coming up in the backyard, or whatever flowers come up in the late winter, early spring. And she said, I looked at those flowers and I thought, don't you know? Don't you know what happened? You're not supposed to be here. You can't be here. And she was just surprised at herself, like, it was so strange to look at those flowers that way. It's like when we suffer our a great loss, it's like the whole world is supposed to come to a stop. Everyone's supposed to stop and know about it. And yet, the bus goes by, you know, the TV's on. Life goes on. And then when we come to that place of, of uh, being normal again, it is quite refreshing. So we have here uh, what he calls, first of all, climbing out. And, um, and then we, uh, we help them at this stage also to exercise caution, again, with decision making. Hey, my life is back on normal, back on track. Now I'm going to jump into making these big decisions again. Maybe they are ready, but make sure that, uh, that you're there to talk it through and make sure it's the right thing to do. And then gaining hope. A uh, person is becoming more objective about what has happened to them, can see things more clearly, and their sense of hope now is more present than absent as it increases. That's a beautiful thing. And then the fourth, the fourth, all right, I'll just tell you because my page won't turn. Uh, the fourth is uh, the reconstruction phase. And so now there's a um, spontaneous expression of hope. There's now a new sense of confidence. And life is filled with new things. There's been growth that has come out of this experience. There is, uh, you're not the same. The person is not the same anymore through this experience. And there are perhaps, as a result, new people there are new things, there are new opportunities. And then there is a reflection on the newness and the growth. And so crisis and trials can be the means of exciting growth in someone's life. And uh, I don't know if you read their Pruitt's book, Run from the Pale Pony, a story about his, uh, his uh, trial with multiple sclerosis and how he turned the trial. It's amazing when you read that, it's like, wow, really kind of heavy. But he took his trial and he took his himself in his wheelchair and earned a PhD uh, during this, you know, with his multiple sclerosis, decided to fight back and he did and earned his PhD. Pretty impressive. And think about what character, uh, what character he gained out of this long protracted, well, lifelong trial once he contracted, contracted it. Think about what he gained through this as a person because he decided to take on the battle. And it's truly amazing. Well, it's called the Pale Pony. Uh, it's in, uh, I don't know what page it's on, maybe someone's here. Pardon? 156. So attitude, uh, attitude in the trial and in the crisis is everything. And so we could ask, okay, how can this trial make me a better minister of Christ is really what we want to ask. God's all over it. He's in it. So we have now in this class 15 minutes left. Wow. So why don't we get in groups of maybe four? We'll get in groups of four, four, four. And then uh, if, if uh, then you can just fit in because a couple groups are going to have to have five, I think, to make it work numerically. So why don't we get in groups and talk about the phases? And I'd like you to look at the chart, which is uh, on page... 
145. And maybe, you know, I'm just thinking about this. You know what? I think I would prefer to do it this way. Why don't we do it in groups of two? And you'll take turns. One of you will be the person in crisis, and the other will be the counselor, the helper. And um, I would like you to use that chart on page 145 to help the person understand uh, the phases that they're going to experience in this crisis process. And of course, you're not going to have to actually read all of this to the person, but kind of, you know, glance at it and incorporate it and help them to understand. Be empathetic, be sensitive, be aware of the words you're using, and you really want to consider that person. Really think of them in a crisis situation. Maybe they can tell you what happened to them or what their loss is, so you're going to have to think of what the loss is. So come up with a loss, share it with the, the person who is there, to, with a the counselor, and then the counselor, use this chart or whatever you want in the class to help them uh, come to a place of some stability and understanding. Okay, so maybe do that for like seven minutes and then switch and then the other person will be the, play the other role. And those uh, on uh, taking this by extension, you can do that too. So that'll take us to the end of the class.